Hello, so my name is William Rhodes, and I am a research scientist at Virginia Tech, and my research focuses on uh, the growth and control of opportunistic pathogens in building plumbing systems and uh, water quality in building plumbing systems in general. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about you know, this kind of unique scenario that we found ourselves in where uh, stay-at-home orders uh, issued to you know, prevent the spread of COVID um, has altered the way um, water is moving through our distribution and building plumbing systems and, and some of the concerns that we have over the water quality uh, as we reoccupy or reopen those buildings. Uh, so I'm going to turn my webcam off. I just wanted to say hello, um, and I'm going to turn the webcam off for the, the rest of the presentation. Uh, so as I get started here, I do want to recognize several uh, collaborators and um, colleagues that I've been working with that have really influenced and developed my uh, thinking on this. They don't necessarily agree with everything that I'm that I'm going to present today, but uh, these are other people that, that really are leaders in this area that I want to acknowledge. Um, and there's been a, a group of us that wrote a, a paper that's available as a preprint, uh, Consideration for Large Building Water Quality After Extended Stagnation, uh, which in, includes several of these people that are acknowledged here, Tim King, Kelsey Piper, Andrew Welton, and Caitlin Proctor, as well as those that are, that are linked um, near, the, uh, near the printout there and then other groups and individuals as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that you know, this is a developing area um, and, and there's a lot of uh, good thought out there and, and I wanted to acknowledge those leaders. Uh, so I think, you know, we're really gonna just jump right in. Um, and I, I just wanna start out by acknowledging the fact that, that we really know that there are negative impacts of water quality um, due to water age or water residence time in our distribution and building system. And many of these chemical, biological, and physical issues are actually, you know, either directly or indirectly linked to a potential uh, public health impact, meaning that their changes can uh, ultimately impact public health. Uh, we know that this is true uh, at the distribution system level of the water in our water mains underneath our streets, and we know that this is true in, in building plumbing systems as well. And so this, this notion of water age is, is really important to, to get a handle on. In the distribution system, uh, water age can really vary from days to weeks, uh, depending on where an individual building is uh, in the distribution system relative to uh, the you know point of entry POE uh, or the water treatment plant. And you can see here this is a, a map of the city, uh, and green indicates kind of shorter water residence times, meaning the water gets to those buildings faster, and red indicates that it, it takes longer to get to those buildings. And with the COVID stay at, uh, stay at home orders, the question that that we're kind of asking right now is is on a system wide basis, what is the increase in water age? Uh, so there's a notion that, that if, you know, you, water use is decreased across the whole system, then the water age could get, get higher across the entire system. Um, but then there could also be kind of little hot spots of uh, inactivity, uh, for instance, in highly commercial areas where uh, water age really localized, uh, localized water age increases and, and decreases water quality. So this is kind of the, the unknown situation that we're dealing with on, on the distribution system wide. Uh, aspect. And this is all in the context of the fact that, you know, our buried piping infrastructure uh, is not in the greatest health that it's ever been in. So the American Society for Civil Engineers has given us a, a grade of D, uh, where, you know, the majority of pipes in many systems, and this is just one example on the screen here, uh, that, you know, the majority of our pipes are over 80 years old. Uh, and so if you have, you know, increased water age, it means that uh, water is hanging around in older pipes that, that may deteriorate the water quality uh, more rapidly than, than newer pipe materials. Um, and, you know, and under regular circumstances, there's been a, a drastic increase in the amount of water main breaks over the last six years. It's a 27% increase. 
And these kind of you know, drastic hydraulic disturbances can release a lot of debris um, and contaminants into our water system that react with our uh, disinfectant residuals and, and change water quality and impact it negatively. Um, we know that you know, even under a normal scenario, we need about $1 trillion of funding over the next 25 years to maintain our buried infrastructure. Uh, and this is coming at a time when, you know, local and statewide funding for water and wastewater projects um, is also decreasing. So, you know, we've got this situation where our infrastructure is already aging and we might be running into these problems already. And then we've added to it this unknown factor of, of COVID stagnation and water age. So if we think about total water age, of course, that's the distribution system water age from the uh, water treatment plant. Uh, to an individual building, uh, which can vary from days to weeks or in, in some distribution systems. And then we've got the building plumbing wa uh, system water age as well, which is the, the time that it takes from that water when it enters the building to when it's actually used at a, a drinking water fountain or tap or shower. Um, and in buildings that can also range from, you know, minutes to hours to, to, to days or weeks. Uh, so, and that's under normal circumstances, so then both are obviously potentially increasing due to COVID. Uh, to what degree, we don't quite know yet. There are some initial reports that, that some municipalities are reporting a 40% decrease in water sold, um, but we don't really know how widespread that is. But there is widespread concern that it's going to lead to the development of water quality issues. And the one that you know kind of is is getting maybe the most attention right now, and and potentially rightfully so, uh, is the growth of Legionella. Uh, Legionella is the is the bacteria that causes Legionnaires' disease. Uh, we're infected by Legionella through inhalation of aerosols. Um, and again, under regular circumstances, the incidence of Legionnaires' disease has been increasing uh, by over 500 percent over the last 20 years. Uh, in 2018, there were over 10,000 cases that were reported to the Centers for Disease Control, and about half of those were related to potable water. Um, and, you know, in, in most situations when we talk about, especially Legionnaires' disease outbreaks, uh, outbreaks occur where there are multiple preventable failures, either through the water management, uh, water management program or, or you know, building uh, managers or building owners, um, but they could also include, you know, human error, equipment failure, and external conditions as well. But this process failure that is included in 65% of the the uh, outbreaks that the CDC analyzed includes having low disinfectant residuals. Uh, so, you know, as this is something that can be in affected by the COVID stagnation, it, it's obviously of concern here. Um, and in, in many instances, it really takes more than one of these types of errors or failures uh, for an outbreak to occur. Uh, but it's notable that, you know, a, a good amount, 44% uh, of these outbreaks occur in hotels and resorts, which are highly unoccupied and underused right now. So it's really important that, you know, all of these types of buildings are, are taking into consideration what they can do. Um, so we, we have some actually a, quite a good number of resources to you know kind of logically approach how to uh, prevent issues with the development of Legionella and Legionellosis uh, in our building systems and and the primary uh, uh, resource that people can turn to is um, ASHRAE Standard 188, which really lays out some some minimum requirements for uh, buildings to reduce or manage that that Legionnaires' disease risk. And one of the primary things that 188 does is to identify building level risk factors uh, that make an individual building more likely to have uh, you know, issues with um, Legionella uh, and Legionnaires disease incidents. And these include uh, you know, things like having you know, bigger complicated plumbing systems like centralized hot water systems, uh, buildings that are taller, more than 10 stories, uh, and buildings that house, you know, el elderly people or immunocompromised people. Um, and then there's a sister document also by ASHRAE, ASHRAE Guideline 12, um, and I'm listing 2,000 here, but 
uh, 12-2020 just came out and is available. Uh, so I highly encourage folks that are interested uh, to, to download that. Um, but it, it, and that document really lays out better detail about how to, how to prevent uh, Legionella growth in, in building plumbing systems. But because COVID is, you know, uh, the stagnation related to COVID is really a unique experience to many buildings, it brings up this question of whether we need to recommission the building. So if we think about commissioning of buildings, when, when new buildings are built, uh, there's a process that's required uh, to occur before the building is, is turned over for occupancy. And that process is called commissioning. But then, you know, really after that, it's up to the building owner to, to manage and maintain that system. So it brings up the question if, if there should be some recommissioning process. And here I'm thinking about recommissioning as steps taken to reduce risk uh, of water quality issues that may have developed during prolonged stagnation due to low building occupancy. And uh, we're going to dive deeper into this uh, kind of definition a little bit later, uh, focusing on these bold and italicized words, because, you know, those are kind of vaguely defined um, in, in uh, our current practice. But generally, recommissioning can consist of building plumbing disinfection, uh, introducing some sort of chemical or thermal treatment to the building, uh, or, you know, even just targeted flushing to remove loosely attached scale biofilm sediment. So, uh, you know, really focused on removing contaminants that, that might have developed during the stagnation period. Uh, there have been a lot of guidance that has been released uh, surrounding how to do this. So the CDC has released guidance for reopening buildings. Uh, notably, they have addressed the need to uh, consider worker safety, which we'll talk about in detail. Uh, but then they list out eight steps to minimize Legionella before buildings reopen. Um, and in these eight steps, um, you know, there's a couple that really specifically apply to the potable water system or, or building water system. Uh, and those include developing a water management plan, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, setting your water heater to above 140 degrees Fahrenheit to make sure that you thermally control Legionella in the hot water system, and then to flush your system. Um, but, you know, when you release guidance at this level, so this is, you know, theoretically applicable to all building types, uh, the, the notion to flush your system um, is, you know, inherently has to be kind of vague because there's so much variability in the types and sizes and uses of our building plumbing system. So the CDC kind of issues um, general guidance, but there's not really the ability to go into enough detail in this type of guidance uh, to really um, think through how to, to do that in all different types of buildings. The EPA has really similar level of guidance, goes into a little bit more detail, but, but again, guidance at that level inherently um, it has trouble being overly uh, specific um, for actually how to apply those recommendations. Um, and that's, you know, of course, due to the variability in design, use, and occupation, uh, um, occupant risks of the various different building types, whether you're talking about commercial, industrial, recreational types of buildings. So there's a, a very high amount of variability. Um, but there are some commonalities about how to progress through building flushing that can conceptually be applied to all buildings. So if, if you're in a build if you're in a building or an area that is highly commercialized and there might have been um, you know general water stagnation in the distribution system of the main distribution system supplying water to the building, there might be you know sediment or corrosion scale or other debris that has accumulated or you know become a little bit less stable in that main distribution system. So some buildings may want to consider starting with hydrant flushing um, so that when they start flushing their water, they don't release that sediment into the building system, which can clog valves and, uh, you know, precipitate all kinds of water quality problems that, that you really just don't want to introduce to your building. So to avoid that, um, if you can coordinate with your utility or if you own the hydrant on your property, you can, uh, again, coordinate with your, the utility, the water supplier, but you could flush those, uh, flush those mains so that you don't introduce that sediment 
um, into the building, but rather flush it uh, flush it out before it ever goes into your building. Um, but regardless, uh, if you don't have the ability to do hydrant flushing, the next step would be to focus at the point of entry or POE. Um, and you know you can flush at a high flow rate, and usually in the mechanical room through the service line. And the idea here is to dislodge any sediment or debris in the service line or water main if you don't have the ability to flush the hydrant, but make sure that you're flushing that down the drain and that that water is not entering your main building plumbing system where sediment and debris can accumulate and cause water quality deterioration. And what you're looking for here is you know, steady temperatures. Um, and if you can measure chlorine, which is definitely preferred, a uh, steady level of, of chlorine as well. And then you can use the, that temperature and chlorine level as an indicator uh, for good cold water quality uh, in the rest of your building as you're flushing. And, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So after the point of entry, you would want to then move to your mechanical equipment, your you know, water heaters, water softeners, pressure tanks. Uh, these are things that you know typically are uh, have annual maintenance associated with them, so you can review when that was last done. Um, and if it's you know if there's a need for that uh, prior to flushing, you can maintain those systems according to your manufacturer's recommendations. Um, if they've been recently maintained and are in good working order, uh, then the idea would just be to flush them effectively to make sure that. The water entering and exiting them is, is as representative of its fresh water from the utility as possible. Then you want to move to your main branches if you have the ability to. And the idea here is that you want to use a higher flow rate to flush the main branches of your plumbing system. Uh, so for the cold water, that could uh, involve flushing at your uh, riser drains or within your building chases. Uh, and if you don't have those options, Typically, uh, janitor's closets are a good location to do this because they can, they, they can receive a, a higher flow rate. Um, but the idea is to, to flush out that main branch of cold plumbing uh, before the individual uh, drop legs or distal uh, lines. For the hot water, um, I would recommend that you flush at the return lines. There's usually some sort of sampling or uh, flushing uh, hose bib that you can flush at. And what you're looking for here is a less than five degree Fahrenheit drop from the supply to the return, um, and ideally a detectable disinfectant residual. Uh, that would indicate that you've, you know, you've uh, started to turn over your hot water system because typically there's much lower levels of disinfectant in hot water because disinfectant decays faster uh, in hot water. But you know, there's a whole lot of variability in buildings. And in some buildings, you'll find that uh, as you flush, you actually deplete the hot water in the building because you're using water at a faster rate than it, than it can regenerate. So you're kind of running out of hot water. Um, and then in other buildings, you can you know, flush indefinitely and never run out of hot water, depending on the design of the system. So that's kind of a site-specific criteria that, that you'd want to consider. Um, so after your main branches, then you can move to your distal outlets uh, working, you know, I would flush uh, cold water first. Um, and again, you're looking for that steady temperature or, uh, you know, chlorine residual um, at those outlets. And usually after you've flushed your main branches, um, if, if you're in a building that can do that effectively, uh, then it should only take a couple minutes to achieve that good water quality there. Then I would move to the hot water uh, and flush until you get uh, temperature levels that is uh, representative of the water supply temperature. Um, ideally, uh, 140 if you temper it down, um, then really you should make sure that's above 120 or 122 Fahrenheit. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but again, here, depending on the size of your system and how you're doing your flushing, you may actually deplete the hot water. So you'll see a decrease in hot water steady state temperature as you flush more and more taps. Um, or you can kind of have an indefinite supply of hot water. So it really depends on how your system is uh, designed and operated. So you have to consider that on an individual basis. Then you move on to special devices like ice machines. You know, you can waste a couple batches, flush out the soda machines, coffee makers, things like that. And then you can move on to your non-potable systems, uh, which would be, you know, maintenance of your uh, cooling towers or sprinkler system, um, 
or, or, or things like that, uh, you know, cycling them or performing the, you know, the recommended maintenance um, as, you, as you run into it. Uh, if you can't do all of that at the time of startup, then you could consider limiting what you open. So if you have a, a hot tub or a pool or a spa, uh, for instance, if you need to open the building, you could restrict access to that until you can perform those, you know, those adequate uh, maintenance uh, actions on those non-potable systems. Um, but in general, before you, you know, before you release occupancy, you want to you want to make sure that each of these systems are, are maintained. So that's the general flushing order. Um, and, you know, just because there's so much variation and uh, complexity involved, um, you know, I, I don't want to get in too many of the, you know, minute, minute details. I'm going to provide uh, a curated list of resources that, that really provide good guidance on these things. I do want to point out that um, I, along with uh, Andy Welton and Caitlin Proctor at Purdue, we've developed a, a guidance document evaluation tool that really just outlines things like the scope and applicability, um, whether the guidance is gonna recover routine flushing, recommissioning flushing, disinfection, uh, testing both of the chemistry and biological parameters of the, of the water, uh, worker safety and communication. And really our goal with this evaluation tool, which you can download at the link there, uh, is basically just to inform people of, of why these topics should be included in a guidance document and some technical notes regarding um, you know what they might include so I invite you to to review that after the, the presentation but in general I did also want to point out that you know there are uh, over 30 uh, guidance documents that have been released and I've started to review and kind of assess them um, and you know this is probably not the, the best representation uh, or best way to go about it, but as an initial kind of preliminary look, um, just kind of in different categories for a recommissioning flushing protocol, uh, of which there were 20 unique protocols, I just kind of rated them on a one to four scale, depending on just the clarity of the document. And as you can see by the amount of red here, uh, it indicates that, you know, there, there really is, um, you know, some details that, that might be missing from a very thorough uh, uh, thorough guidance document protocol. But I think that, you know, if we back up and, and ask ourselves what could be useful to a broad audience, I think that there are, you know, these flushing protocol development 101 concepts that, that are broadly useful. And so I want to focus the rest of this talk really on um, identifying some of the limitations in the knowledge with respect to specific recommendations that are included in some of the guidance materials. So we're going to start with determining whether recommissioning is even needed. Like, do I need to flush or maybe even disinfect uh, my water? What should I do? So in doing this, really what we're trying to answer is uh, defining these kind of, um, you know, hard to define uh, terms. Like, what is prolonged stagnation versus regular stagnation? Uh, you know, what, how do we define low occupancy? And so, you know, in my thinking, I've turned to the existing ASHRAE documents to, to try to help inform that. And if we look at ASHRAE 188, uh, they define, um, you know, for new buildings, if the new building is, is if occupancy is delayed uh, longer than two weeks, but less than four weeks after the original disinfection, which is part of the, the commissioning process, um, then that building should uh, be, you know, be very well flushed. So at a minimum, you can think about two weeks as kind of a, a, a cutoff, but you have to kind of keep in mind that this is in the context of a new building that was recently disinfected. So ASHRAE 188 defines, okay, it's for a new building that's recently disinfected. If it's stagnant for longer than two weeks, then we should really go in and, and, and flush again. Um, that might end up needing to be done more frequently for some buildings and less frequently for others. And we'll talk about how to make that decision here in a second. But then defining low occupancy, that one's a little bit more of a moving target. I couldn't really find good examples of, of how to define this in a definitive way. And there's just, there's just really not the, the, the kind of data that we need to, to robustly define that. 
Um, in some of the conversations that I've been having, we've been discussing um, looking at reduction in water use, for instance, looking at a water bill. Um, but then we asked, well, what level of reduction is really, you know, of concern? Is it 10%, 30%, 50%? We don't really know. Um, so, you know, as a beginning definition here, uh, I would be looking to see if your building has performed something or, or has decreased its occupancy or water uses in response to COVID. I think that's your kind of first and most obvious sign that, that maybe you should be thinking about changes in water quality um, relative to your normal uh, water use. So maybe that's a little bit obvious, but it, it's worth stating explicitly that, that we really don't have a good definition for this. And then the other way to think about it is to look at defining risk. So if we turn to ASHRAE guideline 12, uh, they've got some criteria, um, albeit not, not extremely well spelled out in the guideline uh, for how to think about whether you should be you know, flushing or even considering uh, remedial or continuous disinfection in your building. And the first one that I wanna touch on is the water quality supply. So that's the water coming from the utility. Uh, so you can contact your utility to uh, to determine some of these things and have a conversation with them. That might be helpful to, uh, you know, help with understanding if you don't have that experience as a, a building owner or operator. Um, but in general, you should be aware that utilities are, are really required to maintain a minimum level of disinfectant in their distribution system. And that minimum requirement varies by state and uh, jurisdiction. So some of them are required to maintain a quote unquote detectable uh, level of disinfectant, uh, which you know depends on the method you're using. Uh, there are EPA approved methods that kind of dictate that, but then some actually specify for free chlorine or chloraminated systems, a level of disinfectant that should be maintained. And in general, the amount of disinfectant that you're gonna get from your utility is gonna be uh, variable depending on the type of residual that you have in your distribution system, whether they use a free chlorine residual or a monochloramine residual. Uh, it's gonna depend on the location in the distribution system, whether you're close or far away from that uh, water treatment plant. Uh, the seasonality, uh, you know, from summer to winter, the residuals can become more or less stable. And then specific actions taken by the utility whether they may, might be performing increased flushing due to uh, you know, uh, stagnant distribution systems. Um, they might consider increasing the levels of disinfectant residual to maintain their minimum uh, levels. Um, and some utilities actually temporarily change their disinfectant on an annual basis to help maintain the system. So these are all things that you can figure out by calling and, and chatting with your utility or getting online and looking at the consumer confidence reports that utilities are required to maintain. The other aspect of guideline 12 that, that might help define risk is looking at the environmental conditions. And so really what this means is uh, the operational parameters uh, in your individual building system. And I, I'm just gonna flash this up here to say, you know, for, for different cold water and hot water aspects, there, there are some starting points uh, for which you know we can define water quality that that would be expected to minimize the risk of Legionella growth. Um, and, and we'll we'll dive into this a little bit more. But basically, uh, if you're a building and you can maintain all the best practices, well, maybe that lowers the the need to to flush or disinfect your system a little bit. Uh, but again, this is a, a something that is is relatively unknown and unstudied. What level of stagnation for how long? Uh, under what factors or conditions does this become really important? We just don't know yet. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna touch on to define risk is looking at the individual served. Uh, so, you know, looking back to, you know, ASHRAE and CDC, there are risk factors of occupants with the, you know, people being elderly, having certain habits like smoking or abusing alcohol or drugs having chronic underlying issues, uh, immune system deficiencies, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, if you're a building that, that has very few of these types of occupant risks, well, maybe that puts you in a little bit lower of a, of a risk category uh, versus someone that, that, you know, routinely has people in their system, uh, for example, like a hotel. Okay, so then the second step for, you know, kind of 
high level flushing protocol development um, would be de to determine whether sampling for Legionella should really be conducted and then of course responding appropriately. And I like asking that question rather than asking whether disinfection is needed because um, you know, I would never really recommend that someone just go in and disinfect a building without really having a clear understanding about what risks they are trying to, you know, remediate and have the ability to measure uh, the success of remediating those risks. So instead of saying, should I disinfect, I would say, should you sample for Legionella and then you respond accordingly. So going back to ASHRAE 188 to help us identify this, um, you know, they, they look and say, okay, if, if occupancy is delayed for more than four weeks, then the need for disinfection, flushing, or both uh, shall be determined by the program team. So again, it, it goes back to letting the, you know, the individual building assess their risks based on, you know, maybe the factors of their, their building design and operation or who's in their building um, or whether they can maintain these, you know, best practice engineering controls or not and then decide to react accordingly. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to just say everyone should disinfect. I don't think that that's, uh, that's the way to go. Um, and so, you know, of course, you can, you can look at these risk factors, occupant risk factors, or, or your operational settings to help do that. And if your individual building comes to the conclusion that, uh, you know, you really should be sampling for Legionella, uh, the number one thing, you know, I could spend another five hour seminar on how to sample and how to interpret those samples and react appropriately. Um, what it comes down to is you need to hire someone with experience in looking into these issues and help you navigate uh, how many samples to collect, where to collect them, how to collect them, and then how to interpret those results and, and, and respond adequately. Um, it's, it's just not something that you should be probably navigating on your own unless you have a good amount of experience with that. And then the last uh, kind of 101 here is to implement routine flushing. I mean, I think, you know, any building that is sitting stagnant should be should be considering, you know, where their unused taps are and regular ex regularly exercising those taps to maintain water quality. Uh, you know, so these routine flushing protocols can kind of follow that same order of logic from, you know, the point of entry to the distal outlets and non-potable systems, and they should be designed to simulate normal use. Um, and I'll provide some examples for, uh, you know, for resources to go to, to really get detailed um, information on how to do that. They should be scaled up or down with occupancy. So if you're in a totally shut down building and you open up 50% of it during phase one of COVID recovery, uh, that other 50% of the building is still sitting stagnant. And, and while you know, half the building can, you know, be relied upon for the occupants to use the water. The other half needs to, you know, you need to have uh, parameters in place for that. Um, and then whenever you're, you're doing routine uh, flushing, the focus really should be on maintaining recommended control limits. I can't stress that enough. And so there's some basic tools that are worth looking at uh, for investing in um, if you have the capacity. Uh, one is an EPA approved uh, free and total chlorine uh, colorimeter. Um, you know, I, I don't support any one, uh, you know, brand. There are many different brands uh, available, but uh, they're easy to use and, and the reagents are cheap. It's, it's, it's worthwhile for making sure that your core systems are maintained. A rapid response thermometer is really good. Uh, you know, you can, you can get your temperatures uh, and log them and keep records of them, make sure that you're meeting all those engineering practices that are good. And then you could in, uh, consider, if you don't already have them, uh, inline temperature gauges and sampling ports to, to sample the core parts of your system um, to make sure that you're, you're meet regularly meeting those, uh, those recommended parameters. But then with routine flushing, we also have to address kind of the elephant in the room. Um, how frequently should you flush the water? And this is another area where, you know, we really just don't have the, the level of information that, um, that we really need to make a robust recommendation. Um, many water management plans in healthcare uh, recommend uh, flushing once per week for unused outlets. And then if there are custodial uh, practices that are daily, they, they flush the water in individual rooms. 
um, during you know daily cleaning and things like that. Um, but those recommendations are generally in the context of a building that is being used that's, that's an occupied building. Um, and so it, it's kind of unclear whether a totally stagnant building uh, that would be adequate or not. Um, in one study, it was uh, suggested that uh, flushing every two hours would need would be needed to maintain adequate results. But this isn't that wasn't a uh, poorly maintained hot water loop uh, that kind of had ideal growth temperatures for uh, for Legionella. So you know, there's no good scientific evidence for a catch-all recommendation. But again, I return to if your flushing practices are achieving the recommended control limits then you're, in, you're, you're likely in a much, much better place. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of these because you can, uh, of course, pause this or come back to the, the presentation later. Um, but I just wanna point out that for you know, cold water systems, for stagnant and flush samples, um, then you know, you've, got, uh, you've got certain recommendations that, that are, are pretty sure to, um, to help reduce the likelihood that Legionella will grow. You're not going to take care of all the situations and all the variability, um, but if you maintain these core systems in this way, um, then your your risk is is very much reduced. And then the final thing that I'll say about routine flushing is that you know, in a, as a long term goal, um, you know, people that that are concerned about their water quality should be developing water management plans as soon as practical. I, just because it takes so much time, effort, and, and resources to develop and implement an effective water management plan, I don't think it's realistic or feasible to expect buildings to do this while they're trying to respond uh, with, you know, um, reduced staff, for instance, um, in, in building systems. But uh, as a long-term goal, they can develop these plans, and there's a lot of really great resources uh, to do that. <clears throat> And then the final thing that I that I want to talk about in general is uh, reducing exposure to aerosols during flushing um, flushing activities. Uh, and so, you know, I think my grandpa said it all the time: control what you can control. I think that that's probably the advice of any good mentor. Um, but you know, infection by these opportunistic pathogens really requires the presence of the human pathogen at levels that can cause disease. Uh, so that is the goal of flushing practices and water management plans and, and those engineering controls to reduce the likelihood that they, they can grow or establish in our system. Uh, infection requires transmission of the pathogen to the host. Uh, so, you know, in, in some instances, we might want to consider using personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, and because we're exposed to these opportunistic pathogens through aerosol inhalation, uh, it's really uh, an N95 respirator or better uh, that can protect people from exposure to the aerosols. But uh, at the current time, you know, the availability and access to these um, to to the PPE um, is really focused on getting those to to healthcare, and uh, you know, people may not be able to um, may not be able to access or get those. Uh, so you can take other methods to reduce, you know, your exposure to aerosols. I'll, I'll talk about those on the next slide. And then the last, um, you know, requirement for infection is host susceptibility. So this is where it becomes really important to communicate with your employees and occupants of the building to make sure that they're aware of this risk so that they can voice their concerns or take precautions against their exposure. So, for instance, someone who is immunocompromised, you know, they may not want to be assigned a, a flushing activity. And so, you know, it's really up to the employer or building owner or manager to inform people of the risk so that they can, they can um, react accordingly. So then there are a bunch of uh, methods to reduce, but albeit not eliminate the exposure to aerosols. Um, and they span from, you know, if you have a centralized air system, you can increase your outdoor air makeup uh, to make sure that you're turning over the, the building um, uh, more frequently. Uh, you can turn on vent fans, um, and then if you've got uh, you know, specific devices that create a lot of aerosols or, or just even regular taps, you can physically remove shower heads and sprayers or 
attach a hose or a bag or a towel to the outlet to direct the flow directly to the drain. Um, and then it's kind of a last ditch effort after you kind of make sure that you're not going to flood a room, um, you can exit the room while flushing as well. Uh, so these are all, you know, strategies uh, that, that have a variable um, impact on actual exposure, but, um, you know, if, if this is a concern, then these are these are good practices to take. And then, um, you know, so this is kind of a high level overview. I wanted to provide, you know, some of this background on our knowledge limitation on specific recommendations. Um, but there are some, you know, really good resources out there to help uh, people kind of think through the specifics. Um, and so there's general information by the EPA and CDC. I highly suggest you download and buy ASHRAE Guideline 12 2020, a uh, very useful document. Um, our evaluation tool for guidance is linked there. Um, and then there are some specific guidance recommendations developed by a couple of groups that really, you know, they, they're not all the same and they don't go all into the same detail. Um, but there are some good, uh, you know, good thinking there and good tips to to um, help, uh, you know, uh, flush out the system. Um, and then I will say that, you know, for a bunch of the equipment, you're really just going to have to main, uh, rely on maintenance documents. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out um, that other people have I've seen touched on this uh, is is things like alternate water service entries. So if you've got multiple pipes from your water main distribution system coming into your building, uh, you really want to assess how those are connected and make sure that while you're flushing, you're flushing all of them and make sure that not one is, is really stagnant. Um, there are issues with air gaps and dead ends. That's under a normal scenario, so I didn't want to go into too much detail there, but uh, there, are some, there are some good webinars out there um, on that. Um, Parallel devices is another is another big thing where you know if you have a parallel line, uh, all the flow in the water could be directed through one line and then the other line not get any flow. Um, and so this uh, um, Tal Whitney, these two links kind of uh, discuss some of those those factors that that are, are are really interesting. And then the final thing to consider is the sewer and drains, making sure that your, you know, your P-traps are filled with water so you're not getting uh, sewer gas into your system, and then to make sure that your drains can actually support the flushing that you're considering doing. So with that, I will uh, end my presentation. Um, I invite you to, um, to uh, you know, Send in, in questions and reach out to me if you have specific comments, questions, or concerns regarding this content. Um, and I'm happy to, to assist and help if I'm able. So thank you so much.